This program was first broadcast on Canterbury's access media station, Plains FM, and was made with the assistance of New Zealand On Air. Hello, everybody, and welcome to God is Not Absent, a podcast in which we share stories of faith in the lives of New Zealanders today. This podcast is hosted by me, Apoorva Patel Khanna, a young woman who has embarked on her own journey with God and is incredibly curious to know if God really is as dead or absent as many Westerners seem to think. I'm hoping that through this podcast, we'll see how vibrant and how real God really is. Because if God really is not absent, well then, that changes everything. Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of God is Not Absent. This week, we have Amos joining us. Hello, Amos. Hello, Apova. I just realized, I don't know your last name. What is your last name? Um, Plumpton. Plumpton. That is, that's a pretty cool last name. I've never heard that before. Well, welcome, Amos Plumpton. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I know you from a mutual friend of ours, Josh Frankie, if you guys have listened to his episode. Uh, and I know that you do student life, um, which is a great um, Christian organization at university that loves to share the gospel and share who God is to people. But yeah, do you want to say a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in Napier in the North Island in the Sunny Hawks Bay. Nice. Love going to the beach, love the water. It's probably one of the things I miss coming to Christchurch. I don't swim as much. Uh, moved to Christchurch three years ago to study engineering at University of Canterbury. And now I'm in my final year of mechanical engineering. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, to be honest, I did get surfer dude vibes from you. Just like the hair and everything. Yep, definitely surfer dude vibes. Um, super jealous that, yeah, Christchurch isn't that sunny at the moment and it's raining heaps. But anyway, um, yeah, shall we get right into it, Amos? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, Amos, can you tell us a little bit about your faith background and, yeah, how you came to know God? Yeah, um, so I was, I was brought up in a Christian family. I was raised going to a church called Put My Baptist, and I guess we, I feel like I wasn't raised too much under the word in scripture, and there was a little bit of homeschool, um, but my brother really wanted to go to public school because he didn't want us to be weird, <laughs> and eventually mum caved to his nagging and sent us to public school, and from there I started to get a lot of um involvement I guess with other people from different backgrounds and it was it was probably until I got to high school when I kind of I really wanted to be cool I wanted to be one of the cool kids Mm -hmm. um and so that kind of draw drew me away from the values that my parents had handed down to me and just started a, a slow shift into this this hidden life that that my parents didn't know about do they know about it now yeah yeah so what was it this life style of yours um so i guess probably started off just exploring different neighborhoods um abandoned buildings and maybe getting chased by the cops a couple of times and running away. One time my friend said something to me, which was memorable because I was kind of a goody two shoes. And he was like, do you care what your parents think about you or something? Like, come on, do it. Peer pressuring me. Mm. And I was like, oh, maybe I should just explore what life is like. Totally free from any of the rules that they'd given me. And tried my first cigarette with him, um, tried drinking for the first time with him, tried marijuana for the first time. It was kind of in this sort of growing um, growing time through year 10, mm-hmm. 11, 12. By the time I was in year 12, it was like 
most weekends there was a party on, there was a lot of drinking, um, and in the summer we'd go to music festivals and just get get amongst it a lot. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed losing self-control, being reckless, and laughing about the, the silly things we'd done um, the following days. And it started to become like a pattern, like do stupid stuff in the weekend, laugh about it Monday, and then look forward to it on Friday. So then why did you, where was your interest in God in all of this? How did that come about? So I, I drew back from church um, because it, it was, I guess either it was boring or it was convicting, uncomfortable. Occasionally I'd turn up to church and maybe feel some discomfort about the way I was living or the things I was hiding. I went to a few Easter camps. Some of them were really convicting and mm. and even in in like the fun of parties, there were some really, really big lows um, that people don't really talk about much because the highs are far more memorable. Mm. And times I thought, you know, I want to turn my life to Jesus. I want to follow him and I want to trust in him. And Easter camp in year 13 was a big one. Um, I decided like, I'm not even going to sing some of the lyrics in in these songs because I, I know that I'm just not living for Jesus and it's just dishonest and there's no point like pretending I'm going to turn back to him because every time before my life had never changed and I'd always gone back to this this other lifestyle. Um, and then over the four days it slowly softened and by the last day I was like, I want to turn to Jesus, I want to live for him. Um, but then like a week later, was just back to the same old lifestyle. Mm. So what was it about your lifestyle that made you think you needed Jesus? Because you talked about some of the lows. Yeah, I guess in reflection, some of the things we've done, you realise that that's really not loving to other people. Mm. Um, maybe you'd broken broken things or taken things or or shouted at people or really n- not nice stuff and in reflection um it's just it's like how did I how did I get to thinking that was so funny I mean one time just thinking all the things that I love to do now when I was a young child I just thought they were so bad and that I'd never ever do them and that really signaled to me that my morals were fluid. Mm. They move with, I guess, with time and my actions. And so I don't actually have a solid grounding on what is truly good. Mm. Because based on how I live, it, it just changes around. Mm. Um, I used to think things were wrong and and now I, I loved them. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, you said that you really wanted to commit to following Jesus but you just couldn't and so what was what was the process of you being able to commit to Jesus like so yeah I I moved to Christchurch to start uni and I was actually thinking when I get to Christchurch my whole environment will change and I feel like I should turn to Jesus because I've heard the gospel, and I think I think it's true. I think, um, but when I got to Christchurch, my my whole environment did change, but my heart didn't change, mm. and I just started to create the exact same environment around me. But my cousin was going to one of the local churches, and he'd messaged me to meet up to read the Bible every week, <laughs> and I was thinking, this is not what I want to do yeah. in O week. Mm. And so I was like, I can't just keep making excuses. He's going to keep messaging me. Uh, either I say a complete no right now. Mm. And I was like, wait, I wanted to turn. And now I, I'm on the verge of just saying a complete no and so that I can go to my parents and say, you know, I, I live this different life now. 
and move on. Um, and so that just shocked me, I guess, how much my mind had shifted in a short period of time. And I decided that I should investigate Christianity as an adult now that I'd left home. I should ask all the questions, all the doubts that I have. I decided that I'd just say yes to every Christian invitation I got mm. and see if there was truth there. Because if there wasn't, um, I was happy to walk away from it. Mm. And so I got invited to one-on-one -on -one Bible reading, got invited to Bible studies, got invited to church, got invited to a church getaway and student life getaway. And it, at the church, so, yeah, I started to encounter Scripture a mm. lot. And Scripture convicted me. Um, Jesus said in, in Matthew 11 to cities where he'd done a lot of miracles that they will be worse off on the day of judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah, a nation which got wiped out in the Old Testament because they had seen his miracles and not repented. Mm. And I was thinking, I've, I've heard the gospel my whole life, and yet I've been so stubborn to turn to him. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in that boat. Um, but also a passage in Galatians convicted me incredibly as well. It, it says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I was like, wow, I do a lot of these things. Mm. I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I am living out of sinful desires. And I could see that in, in my whole life. My desire was not for God. It was for sin. I loved sin. And and we're born we're born loving sin. Mm. We're born with our back our backs turned to God. Um yeah, the campus church camp was something big changed for me, my understanding of freedom. Um my understanding of freedom changed at the Canvas Church student getaway. Uh, the pastor talked about what is true freedom, and he drew on some analogies. For example, if you think about an Olympic athlete and a couch potato, yeah. the couch potato would say to the Olympic athlete, you're not free. You have a strict diet, you have a strict running plan, you have a strict sleeping plan. You can't do what you want to. You can't come out with us tonight. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're not free. You you have all these rules. And the Olympic athlete would say to the couch potato, you can't run around the block without having a heart attack. <laughs> You're not free. And so what I started to realize is that true freedom can have constraints Sometimes mm. constraints actually protect our freedom, mm. like a fence around sheep that keeps them from falling in holes. Mm. And so I'd gone for a life with no rules, no constraints, mm. follow my desire, indulge in everything. Mm. But yet I found myself burdened and and dragged down and... Mm. And the, the other thing that was said is Jesus Jesus says um in John everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Mm. So I was like, wow, not only does freedom have constraints, but actually Jesus is telling me that I've been living a life of slavery. How does mm. how does that make sense? I didn't listen to any rules. Mm. But I looked at my life and time and time again I turned to my desires, not being fully satisfied, mm. wanted to turn to God, but yet not freed from my sinful desires. I still had them, and I still turned back to them. Mm. And so I saw my slavery in that. 
And so the thing about a slave is they need a third party to liberate them. Mm. They need someone to come and free them. And you know, that that's why Jesus came, mm. to free us from, from our sin, to liberate us. That instead of loving sin, loving what is evil, and loving ourselves above God, that, you know, he would give us new desires to love God instead. And, yeah, that was a big, a big part of the turning point. Mm. I find it so cool that, like, there's clearly a parallel between kind of how you were when you were younger and how you were when you're older, just like you were exploring what it meant to be like a teenager and drinking and all these different things um, just because you wanted to find out what it was like. And then later on, you did the exact same thing, but with Christianity. Um, And I feel like that's just like a part of your personality, um, which I find really cool that you're so curious, um, but you kind of used it for good for yourself later on, I guess. Um, But I find it quite cool um, that that's your story. Um, Yeah, I guess, so you talk about how Jesus is here to liberate us and, you know, um, change our desires. And that is something that I have thought about for so long just because I totally understand you that even I feel like a slave to my sin and all these different things. Um, and the Bible is so clear about um, the pred- the predicament that we are in. And yeah, I just see it so clearly. But how? what was the process of God changing your desires? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I guess I realized even when I was like, wow, okay, the Bible is speaking truth. It is revealing truth in my heart. It's revealing truth in the world. And even looking into the historical evidence of the resurrection, I started to be convinced that this is true. Mm. And so I was wanting to turn to God, um, as I had time and time before. I found myself stuck with a problem, and I was praying, God, I want to live for you, but... My heart wants to live this other way. Mm. So actually I could only say, I want to want to live for you. Mm. Please, please change my heart. Please make me love what is good Mm. and hate what is evil. Love what you love. And I think the Bible talks in Ezekiel about God giving his people a new heart. And Jesus comes to to heal the sick, to open the blind, the eyes of the blind and the, mm. the ears of the deaf. Mm. We need that deep heart change deeper than, than we can reach. Mm. And so I was praying for that um, and slowly started to see the results of that heart change in me. Um, I started to grow a huge love for the Bible, for Scripture. Mm for going to church and hearing it preached, to mm. hearing the truth. I wanted to to follow him. Like I really had that desire mm. as he worked in me, even if it came at a cost of friends or even in times I didn't understand because I knew I could trust him. I knew that his, his rules were actually out of love and sincerity. Um... It's one one passage which I think of is in Titus two fourteen, where it says Jesus who purifies us from wickedness, that we would be eager to do what is good. Mm. There's the huge difference for me um, before sort of putting myself wholly in God's hands than than before. Um, he gave me a heart that really wanted to seek him out and that started to just, just change everything in my life. I didn't want the alcohol, I didn't want the drugs, um, but wanted to to seek his, his good things, his kingdom, and wanted to share, I guess, the freedom that I'd found um, to other people. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amos. Um, that's 
That's so cool what God can do and how he answered your prayers. Um, I guess my final question um, is being a Christian now, like, do you still face challenges in your faith? Like, is everything, does everything feel easy for you? Do you want to do everything good or is it still a challenge? Definitely. It's definitely still a challenge. Um, like my heart's not perfect. I'm not Jesus. Yeah. His work is not complete in me yet. We haven't been raised from the dead yet, but he continues to work in us. And I know that he, he holds us in in his hands and continues to spur us on. And often it's our failings that draw us back to him mm. and we realise again how much we actually need him mm. to draw us to him, that we need him to continue to work in our heart. Mm. I think if I think if he just changed me too quickly, I'd, I might forget yeah. <laughs> how much I was dependent on him to mm. to really change me. Mm. That's really cool. That's a really profound thought, actually. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're coming to the end of the episode now. Um, were there anything, any final thoughts that you wanted to share? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I guess two thoughts to come to mind. I guess in in summary, one of the problems I was facing um, in my earlier life is whether I should live a liberal life or a legalistic life. The the liberal life is do what you want to do, not what you ought to do. Mm. The legalistic life being do what you ought to do, not what you want to do. And I felt like my parents were giving me a legalistic life to live mm. by my own misconception. But I wanted to fit in with my friends and chose the, the liberal life. Mm. Um, but when, when God works in our heart to, to make us want to love him and love what he loves, then there's no contradiction. And what you want to do and what you ought to do become the same thing. Mm. And by that change of desire, it really it sets you free. Mm. Um, and I guess to touch on, you asked if, if there were struggles. Um, and the process of change in my desires, especially in relation to, like, drinking, um, was it took about a year to, to build strong convictions and strong self-control. I'd often mess up and I'd come back to my cousin and I'd I'd just have to tell him what happened that weekend, mm. what I what I got up to, even though we had a plan for how I was gonna have self control and mm. the the look on his face when, when I just confessed to him it felt like it did a lot. He wasn't he wasn't angry or or removed or apathetic, but he he looked deeply sad. Mm. Just that I guess I'd turned back to to old ways and was struggling because of that. Mm. And we just prayed together, and he just continued to read the Bible with me. Mm. And it's through that process, um, built a lot of change in my life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I just love how, yeah, just what your cousin did. It's what God does with us um yeah we're coming to the end of the episode now so is there a song that you'd like to share with us and do you want to tell us a little bit about why you chose that song yep uh the song that i've chosen is called grace alone um i've chosen it because i played it a lot it was like my top played song on spotify and wow i feel like it just describes uh my journey, maybe just any Christian's journey, mm. one lyric in particular that stands out to me is, and at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. Just sort of reminds me how dependent I am for God to, to move in, in me by his spirit to to bring good and good change. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Amos, for joining us on this podcast. Uh and I think a lot of people will, yeah, find a lot of themselves in your story. Yeah, so just 
really appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the song, and we hope you tune in next time. I was an See ya. lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call. Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. But spirit, you made. I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But spirit, you moved in me And at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shown Called into a kingdom that can Thank you for listening. Tune into our episodes every other Sunday at 12:30 p.m. on Plains FM 96.9. Otherwise, catch us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Remember to stay in touch on our Facebook page at God Is Not Absent. See you guys later in our next episode.